Thank you. Uh -huh. All right, let's give them another round of applause here. That's a great job, passionate, and all the things we entrepreneurs have. I want to get real in New York. I want to welcome all the entrepreneurs here. All, the, all of you are growing fast, and you're going to understand one thing I'm about to say. We're going to have to move fast today. We're running behind, just like in a, in a fast growth company, and we got some things to catch up on. So what I want to do is go ahead and introduce someone that's very took some special time to come here and be with the entrepreneurs. And this is a, she's CNN anchor at uh, CNN Money. And she's known as the explainer in chief. Just like we all have to do as entrepreneurs and leaders, we have to be the explainer in chief. And uh, this person has done that at CNN. I would like to rec uh, recognize Christine Romans. Thank you, thank you. This is on. Great. So nice to be with you today. Fantastic. Music was wonderful. Thank you. Um, I just had a few minutes to do an interview with David Karp, um, of course, who's the CEO of Tumblr, who you're here to hear today. Uh, and, you know, I think about what is in the DNA of an entrepreneur. You know, it's innovation, it's creativity, it's risk-taking, of course. And Cliff tells me it's also stick to -itiveness. And I'll tell you that David Karp is someone who has stick to -itiveness. He's had the DNA of an entrepreneur since he was, like, 11 years old. Uh, and his family recognized it, encouraged him, and he has really hit it out of the park in terms of entrepreneurship. He got us started in an animation company building their first blog platform and creating that first internet uh, video for them. He worked at Urban Baby before uh, starting his own software consulting company called Davidville. I mean, he worked at Urban Baby. He went and lived when he was 17 or 18 by himself in Tokyo for seven months and just really dove into the technology part of this company. During a lull in projects, he started working on a little, little, little blogging website uh, that became Tumblr in February of 2007. That little blogging website uh, was sold to Yahoo last year for $1.1 billion, with a B, billion. Tumblr is still growing and now hosts more than 200 blogs, giving creators a place to express themselves and find their voices. He has been named the best young tech entrepreneur by Business Week. He is uh, one of the top innovators of the world. That's from the MIT from MIT. Um, he's, you know, the, the best under 30, the best under 35 in just about every category you can imagine. He is a young, successful entrepreneur, uh, and he is inspiring, and he just told me he wants to work for Tumblr for the next 30 years. So, uh, like all of you, he's an entrepreneur who wants to see his baby through all the way, watch it grow, and scale it. Nice to meet all of you, and I hope you really enjoy your time with David Karp today. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for having me today, guys. Wonderful to be here with you. Okay, we have lots of questions for you, okay. <laughs> and I'm going to get right to it. Um, that's something about the Oxford Center, just like in fast growth companies. Not a lot of fluff. Not just going to get right into it. Why did you start and sell Tumblr? Let's start. Why did you start Tumblr? Started Tumblr very selfishly. It was something that I really, really wanted that didn't exist at the time. Um, the thing that didn't exist was one place on the internet to really call mine, something where I could express all of the stuff that I was creating uh, and not be split up across all of these sort of disparate services like photos going on Flickr and videos going on YouTube and 140 characters going over here and articles going over here. Tumblr was about bringing it all together into one place that could be you know, your, your digital identity. And at the time, it was just my digital identity. It was just something I really, really wanted for me. Actually, I owned davidslog.com, so my, my blog address. I owned for a couple of years before I owned tumblr.com. I mean, this was just, just something that I wanted to create for myself. OK, if you look right here, I know what gets you animated when you and I met. What gets you animated is we start talking about creative artists and Tumblr. And one of our folks here today, John Chandler, we were looking at him and, and found that he's out there on on Tumblr. He's mm -hmm. got a Tumblr blog and he's going around the big labels. Talk about that. Is that part of your passion here? And David, the next question is, can an entrepreneur do this? Let's say they're not in the creative artist. Uh, it certainly works there just as John showing it, but how can entrepreneurs here running a medical business, running a, 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 another type of technology business, use Tumblr for customer advocacy? 
So, you know, we talk about creators a lot. The other end to that, though, is just expression. Creative expression takes a, a whole host of forms. And, um, you know, s some of the uh, most interesting uses of Tumblr aren't from what you would consider traditional creators. They're from journalists. They're from uh, founders who are building something from scratch and telling that story, telling the story of why they're doing this, why they're excited about it, how it's going, the struggles of that. Uh, it can be incredibly powerful at bringing an audience, a current customer, a future customer closer to what you're doing, closer to the mission, and uh, in, in uh, best case, get them really, really excited about the stuff that you're working on. Yeah. OK. Uh, Marissa Meyer, the CEO of Yahoo, has just said this. Uh, I read this week. She said, you're the most perspective. You have the best perspective of any entrepreneur and, um, and, and perceptive. She says perspective and perceptive is, is. About me? Yeah, that's what she said. Oh. <laughs> and she said, um, he's the most perceptive entrepreneur I've been around. How do you see this going on? It was reported in the New York Times this week, sitting right here behind us, is like the Dollar Shave Club. I, I want to get your perception as an entrepreneur and as a leader. You know, the, the consumer now is going straight to um, Wally Barber for glasses, is going straight to um, buy mattresses online, and they're buying these top branded products for half the price. Do you, what do you see with that going on? I, want to, I just want to know your perspective of that. Is Gillette in trouble? So we know the big labels like out of Nashville are in trouble mm -hmm. because these folks here are going around them. But are we going to start going around all big labels, whether it's uh, Gillette or Time Warner or wherever it may be? Uh, that's a question for smarter people than me. But uh, you know, I, I think one of the interesting things to look at in there are the brands that you're describing being in trouble uh, are being disrupted, are, are big multi-billion dollar brands being disrupted by not brands necessarily so much as the promise of easily ordering this thing online, finding something very customizable, whatever it is. It's less about the story. It's less about buying into the, the logo that you have on your sneaker or the, the vision of the inspiring summer that like, hits you every time that you like, uh, buy a Coke. Um, you know, I think one of the things that is a little bit close in that to our world, to, to Tumblr and our business right now, is that to maintain those billion dollar brands and to create those next billion dollar brands is going to take some real storytelling. Because we do live in this world where there's just tremendous uh, convenience and an incredibly disruptive new uh, aspect or consideration in commerce where you know, I'll buy whatever has the highest rating and uh, is available on Amazon Prime rather than you know, really worrying about whether or not it's, it's Puffs or Kleenex, right? So for Kleenex to continue to be meaningful, for Nike, for Coke, for Apple, for any of these guys to continue to be meaningful in a world where um, you do have these, these disruptive forces um, will perhaps in part require some storytelling, some getting people to aspire to wear your shoes and drive your cars. And that, interestingly, takes type of creative storytelling, creative brand advertising that hasn't really existed on the internet in the last decade, right? Uh, or I should say, ha hasn't really found a place on the internet yet. Um, something that is there in spades in traditional media, but hasn't really shown up on a web that is so much designed around you know, little blue links designed to get you to, to buy right now. So the, the Oxford Center says the three most important things for these entrepreneurs to go to the next level right now, and I'll see if you agree with it. One is commitment to innovation, and that means trying a lot of things that don't work. That doesn't mean sitting in a conference room talking about it, but that, out there trying some things that don't work. Customer advocacy, getting your customers to talk about you. And the third one is authentic storytelling. Those are the three things we're seeing when companies get to that next level. You look back at them, you say, well, they did those three things very, very well. What is your opinion on that, of those three things? Those are, those are three great things. <laughs> what, do you, what, what would you add to that? Well, let's see. So, sorry, so let's go through each. So on the, on the, let me, I don't know about adding to them. I can maybe elaborate on a couple of them. So. Yeah, commitment to innovation. Yeah. 
which means, and I, you know, we can try some things that, that don't work. Under Armour, Under Armour tries a lot of things that don't work. They try a couple that, that do, but you, if you look, that, so that, that's commitment and innovation, and then you go to customer advocacy, which we hadn't even touched even a, a ounce on as a industry of having your customers. We've never had this before, where your customers can go out there and be your cheerleaders. Mm -hmm and get them to talk about you. That's a strategy, you know, it doesn't just, you know, sometimes it happens naturally, but some of the better companies yeah. are out there. So I'd say, you know, the second two are strategies, which sound like great strategies, and, and ones that I, I think we've, at least at Tumblr, employed semi-successfully here and there before. Uh, the first point, though, commitment to innovation is the one that strikes me as a real value and something that, uh, you know, I think has been defining of at least the companies that, that inspire me the most. And, you know, to me, that commitment to innovation really means, are you delivering uh, on your promise to your, your users, to your customers? Are you continuing to innovate for them, make their lives better, empower them to do more? And you know, whenever we're sort of looking for our North Star, whenever we, we, we feel hung up on or just, you know, are just generally overwhelmed with the, uh, the, amount of, the amount that we're running with at Tumblr today, um, the thing that we always remind ourselves is at the end of the day, unless we're building tools that inspire creators to come here and make their best work on Tumblr, unless we're building a land of opportunity for them to find an audience, unless we're, we're delivering on that promise, there aren't gonna be any creators here to make Tumblr worth anything that anybody, uh, to make Tumblr anything that anybody cares about, to make Tumblr worth the strategy and building, developing the business and, and all of that. At the end of the day, if we're not innovating for that creative community if we're not building on that promise, like there's kind of nothing here. And I, I think that's an important thing to remember in, I imagine many businesses, it's just, you know, at the end of the day, your bread and butter is your ability to create something that um, empowers people, makes their lives better. And uh, if you're not delivering on that promise, like no strategy is gonna save you. No, that might not be true. I'm sure there's a strategy that will we'll keep you going for a while. The, the, here, here's a hot question. This yeah. is a hot one for you. and. Um, is the people I talk to, you know, they go, Tumblr is, man, what a beautiful design, what a brilliant site. Mm. It's, it's, you know, you're one of the top three minds in social media in all the world right now, is what they say, say David Karp has, has proven that. What, but it's not revenue friendly. How are you gonna make money on this thing? I think it's incredibly revenue friendly, actually. <laughs> I, I would say more than most uh, social networks today. You know, one of the nice kind of defining characteristics of Tumblr is you don't go there for your friends, you go there for the stuff that you love. So, you know, where you go to, not to call anybody out, but you go to many of the bigger social networks today, um, and, adver I mean, we're all building advertising businesses for the most part. You go to a social network where you go there for your friends, where you go there to check on your friends, see what they're doing, uh, converse with them, and, that conversation, that very intimate place, is being interrupted with brand messages, and it's very jarring. I would say it's a very brand unfriendly or brand hostile environment um, in most of those modes, in most of those contexts. One of the wonderful things about Tumblr, uh, from a business perspective or from a brand perspective, is that people go there for the stuff. They go there to be surprised. As long as you're putting something in front of them that they enjoy, they're actually very used to seeing stuff that comes from people that they've never seen before, from places that they've never seen before. 90% of content on Tumblr is actually reblogged, which means when you're sitting on your dashboard, only 10% of the stuff that you're seeing was actually created by the people that you're following. 90% of it is being curated by the people that you're following. So you're very used to seeing stuff coming from sources all over the network. And when the source happens to be GE or happens to be Apple, and it's good, it's great stuff, it blends into all of the other great stuff on the network that you're used to enjoying and ends up being a very native part of the experience and is an opportunity for the brand to get you in a context where they're not pulling you away from a conversation or an intimate moment with your friends, they're not interrupting anything, they are bringing their, their voice and color and creating So are you going to change search as we know it? Is that where you're going with this? You're going to, is that I, don't, I don't think so. And this is, this is um, I, I think the search is, uh, will, will be a piece of I see a smile there. I see a smile. I see a twinkle. I think search is, you know, part of Tumblr is the land of opportunity, making sure that people can find the audience that they deserve. So our, our mission, the, the, the thing that we 
uh, indoctrinate every new, new employee with the thing that we, we go and uh, you know, tell the world, and certainly our users, when, when we really talk about our promise, is empowering creators to make their best work and find the audience they deserve. So the, find, the second half of that, the find the audience they deserve, is hinged on a whole lot of discovery features. So search is, is chief among them, but there are a whole host of ways that we get content, uh, great content, in front of an audience. Uh, the, the bigger piece of that, though, or I should say just as big a, a piece of that, though, is empowering creators to make their best work. So first and foremost, what we're looking at is how do you use these incredible cameras that we all have in our pockets right now, these slow-mo video cameras, these beautiful touch screens with, with editing capabilities. How, how do we use the faster processing power? And let, let me ask you this. Yeah. You, you're, how did you, what did you, t what was your case to Yahoo that we're valued at $1.1 $1 .1 billion? And this, this is a very relevant question because a lot of these people are in negotiations on ex, you know, exiting. Did you, I mean, I just, how did that number come up? Did you say, look, this is where the ROI is? You know, the ROI is because of this right here, because this many bloggers, or this many, this is, we're going to change the world of search. You know what? How did you get that case of $1.1 $1 billion? I mean, that's a, uh, there, there are many dimensions to how you, you arrive at that. I mean, Yahoo is a, a very capable CFO and Ken Goldman who, who you know, looked very carefully it at shocked what us. we were. It shocked us. You know, when that, when that came across the, world, the, the, the screen, we, we were expecting, yeah. okay, 500 million. You know, okay, he'll get four to 500 million. The 1.2, 1.1 billion was the technology world's just fell on the ground. And so I, I, I admire you for doing that. I mean, you, you had a great business case. You had to show that, see, and he's a very capable CFO. You had to say, this is how you don't get your money back. What, what was, tell me one of those dimensions. You said it was multiple dimensions. Well, I just want I mean, there, there are many dimensions to how, how it's, it wasn't a, it wasn't me sitting down in front of Marissa and making a case so much as there are boards and bankers and lawyers and CFOs uh, and in our case, a, you know, a VP of finance who are going, going uh, I don't even want to say back and forth. It's a, it's a much more complex conversation than that to, to get to uh, uh, that point. You know, it's worth pointing out, though, that we, were, we weren't selling the company, which, which kind of changed the dynamic here a little bit. I mean, if there's any, any experience for this room to kind of garner from, from how we went about this, um, it's, it's probably this point, which is uh, we were out there raising money for a few months before the conversation with, with Marissa and her team turned into an acquisition conversation. Uh, we were having conversations with a few big uh, technology and media companies looking for a strategic investment. So we, just, we were just looking to raise money uh, to bridge the gap to profitability, which we needed a little bit more money to do. And uh, we were talking, this we'd already brought on some of the best institutional investors in the world with Spark Capital and Union Square and Greylock and Sequoia, uh, Insight Venture, and a whole, whole host of really some of the best finance guys you would ever hope to work with. We felt like we had enough of those, and if we were going to be taking more money, if we were going to be, be bringing more partners to the table, it would really behoove us to find somebody who could do a little bit more than just cut a check. So we were talking to folks like Yahoo about not just cutting the check, but also showing up with ad technology, with search integration, with content integration. And uh, we were having a lot of conversations that were really exciting. The Yahoo one happened to be one of the most exciting. It happened to be one of the ones where there was just the longest list of stuff that we could do, like that list that I just rattled off. I mean, that's all stuff that Yahoo is capable of, where if you're working with just a media partner, they might be able to bring you some media. They might be able to bring you some audience. We might be able to find some distribution through their network. But Yahoo, it's distribution. It's, a, it's an audience that we've never seen before. It's, it's, a, uh, it's image search products. It's, a, it's search products. It's ad technology. It's personalization technology. Uh, it's a whole, it's, it's relationships with so brand it's, advertisers. It was a whole host of things. And after a few weeks of, of that dialogue about that, that uh, strategic investment or, or, or that type of partnership, it just became very clear that uh, there was a lot for us to do. There, were, there, was a, a, there was a ton for us to do together that so, got um, Marissa to show up uh, in New York and, and say, like, hey, you know, we want to do all of it. We'd love to do all of it without ever having to second guess ourselves, ever having to question whether or not Tumblr is getting too much out of this, whether or not we're seeing enough, of a, enough value from this 
this investment and this partnership, can we just make this official? Can, can we just make you guys? So this is what Marissa said. Yes. Can we, can we this is, the, is this the weekend in New York? This was the weekend in New York. Yeah. yeah. The, the famous weekend. It didn't get done in a weekend, it was, but it got started in it a weekend. It got started. Yeah. Pretty good weekend for you, it turned out. That was good. It was emotional. It was a little overwhelming. But, you know, but, so the productive. two things here is it was a bolt-on acquisition. You really bolted onto them because they already had some things you could use. So that was a key thing is showing Yahoo, hey, just let us bolt on here, and, you, and we can add a lot of value, and you can add a lot of value to us. Is that fair? Yeah, I just don't love that expression, bolt-on. <laughs> but, yeah, it was, uh, it was – look, the, the promise was uh, – uh, they believed that we were on this path. We believed that we were on this path. We believed in our leadership. She believed in our leadership, and uh, wanted uh, wanted to help however they could. Wanted to help move us faster in any ways that they could. And uh, you know, respecting the fact that we were already on this path, and. Um, we didn't need a whole lot of interference. I mean, this this wasn't. But anyway, so you know, the 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 promise then that she laid out and and has really lived up to in this first year. We're we're just a little bit more than a year into this now. Uh, the promise was Tumblr would continue to operate independently and would have the the opportunity to lead on to lean, excuse me, on Yahoo for anything that they'd be able to help help with it, uh, where they could help us move faster. And the, the you know, big first examples of that this year have been in the ad technology and in some interesting stuff that we're doing with content that actually expand the reach of advertising on Tumblr into the Yahoo network. So you know, those, were, those were some huge undertakings that rolled out really, really smoothly and have been a huge boon to our business in this first year. I mean, the, the ad tech one, I really can't understate. I mean, that was one where we are building an ad business from scratch. That technology needs to be really, really robust, and there's a real engineering effort to, to pull together. This is something that all the big networks invest uh, billions and billions of dollars in supporting. Um, we were going to have to build that from scratch. And leaning on the engineers at Yahoo and a whole bunch of work that Marissa had set up around ad personalization when she, she got there a couple years ago. Um, we, were, we were set up and running in weeks and leveraging incredibly sophisticated uh, engineering and ad technology developed by hundreds of engineers that we didn't have. I mean, that was a you, huge, huge boost. You know, in, in, in a way, I think you have changed entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship as we know it in the Valley. Is it going to be done like you did it? You went out and you didn't worry about, you worried about being, having the creative people there to come up with a product, and now you almost, you've gone to somebody else to help you deliver it. It requires so much creativity to build a tumbler and, and, and the way you did it. Is that, is that going to be the, the mode of operation now, you know, as opposed to Apple? You know, Jobs started it, and he built it, and he, he sold the stuff, and he created the stuff. Are there going to be creators that just create these companies on, on the front end and then give them to a team like Yahoo to take it to the next level? Is you, do you what do you think about that as a strategy? I think there's a real gradation. I mean, to be clear, we didn't, we didn't give this to Yahoo to figure out. So we, you know, we continue to operate independently with our own leadership team, right down to our own head of HR, head of finance, own COO. I, I've, I've uh, remained and will continue to remain CEO of, of this thing with sure. our, our team in New York and our, our own offices that are growing, our own team of 300 people, um, our own sales effort. I mean, so, so this is, this is an, an independent, um, business, product, company, and operation, a wholly owned subsidiary of Yahoo, um, which... Well, usually with acquisitions, it yeah. takes about six months for them to get the HR system. Sure. I mean, look, there, there are a lot of ways to approach this. So Systrom really wanted help with a whole lot of the operation. And not to speak for, I mean, this is, I think you, you can see this from uh, you know, pretty clearly just um, from the outside. He, he wanted help with the operations, and he wanted help with scale and engineering. and Shrep brought that to him, and uh, I forget the name of uh, uh, Emily, the, the, uh, their VP of business, c came over from Facebook and helped them you know, whip the operation into shape. And uh, Kevin's gotten to continue to crack on that product and uh, have a tremendous amount of uh, uh, fun and make a tremendous amount of progress building that thing in a, in a way that uh, is perfect for him and where he has all the support that he needs. 
the YouTube guys like got out of there right away and YouTube turned into a Google shop. I mean, there's a real gradation of how these things, um, mm -hmm. how these companies grow. That happens as private companies too. That happens as public companies. So, you know, I don't know. It, it's all, always the same risks. It's always the same, uh, always the same considerations about your culture and your focus and the dynamic of the team, who your partners are. Um, none of that ever really changes. The, the you know, big change for us last year was we replaced our, our board that we've been working with, with sev for seven years with uh, Marissa Mayer, who you know, we've now had the pleasure of working with for about a year and a half. So uh, let me ask Tom Zaki here. Tom, you were you a CEO of TerraCycle, built a global operations, using social media as effective as anyone. In fact, you just started your own TV show. We'll talk about that in another panel. But how do you see Tumblr? What, what questions would you have for Tumblr in, in a Get Real conference? That's a great question. Um, maybe, you know, for the folks that are entrepreneurs here to think through, you know, um, how would someone who's a relatively, uh, you know, say like a medical services company all the way to, you know, say a company that's expanding septic tank installation, what would you recommend for them? How would they use this platform uh, to create to brand. value? Yeah. You're very astute in branding, so give well, them. I don't know about that. Uh, uh, septic tank installation is like a particularly fun one to think about. Um, do you know how septic tanks work? I only actually really learned no. about that. So that's actually, that's probably where I'd take it, is they're actually kind of a fascinating construction that's existed for a very long time. I'd probably tell that story. Uh, so the, uh, uh, I like all sort of feats of engineering. It's a, pr a pretty clever invention. Uh, you know, look, the, the promise of uh, Tumblr that I think isn't, isn't present in, look, I mean, if you're trying to sell uh, a good, if you're trying to sell septic tanks or septic services, uh, you're going to do fine with a lot of little blue links because you're, you're dealing in something that people are going to need. It's going to be a local service. And you want to make sure that when they're searching for that service, um, they find you and there's a really easy way for them to jump over and call you or order your service or buy it online, whatever that is. Um, there are a lot of products and businesses that uh, have a different path to, I want to find a more inspiring phrase than customer acquisition, but have a different path to um, finding customers and getting them to care and getting them to become customers, that's what we call creating intent. And you know what the internet has been so good at to date is harvesting intent, is, is grabbing and targeting that person who's out there who uh, you know, is either uh, just turned of age to like go uh, get their driver's license and is now being barraged on Facebook with Ford and Chevy ads, trying desperately to get them into the Ford dealership before they go into the Chevy dealership. Um, uh, ads that harvest intent by targeting keywords to make sure that you go to the, like this mesophilioma lawyer versus that mesophilioma lawyer. Uh, the kind of ads and the kind of brands that I really admire are the ones that actually create intent and actually get us to aspire to a lifestyle, get us to aspire to um, a, an athletic lifestyle wearing our like Nike gear, our Under Armour gear. Um, brands that, that get us to aspire to like grow up and drive a Beamer, which is a little bit different than whacking you with like 0% financing when you're searching for uh, pickup trucks or when you're searching for Ford. So, you know, the, the same thing that we tell all these brands is Tumblr is an opportunity to tell stories that inspire your customers to become even more invested and to inspire people who aren't your customers yet to become customers, to aspire to wear your clothes, to aspire to drive your cars, um, and inspire them with a lifestyle. So that, that's the, a little bit of the promise of Tumblr for brands that um, you know, I, I think sums up how a lot of these guys have made, it, have made the internet work for them in general. So. I don't know, that's that's the, certainly the stuff that gets me. Yeah. Dr. Schrader, I think you've got a question. But, so David, you're, you're, let's go back to your initial idea of providing a platform for artists and creative people to distribute their 
their creativity across a, 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 larger, a larger audience, reach out to the world. Great. How do we do it in China? How, how do we do it in what? In China. How, you know, you've got a huge, a huge mass of unserved folks. How does Tumblr do it, or how yeah. does the world do it? You know, how do you do it? We, we don't do it. Right. Yeah. So, I, I don't, so I don't how, what's the strategy can. to make it? Yeah, to I, make I don't it think anything. an American business can. At least I, I don't know how they would. Yeah. So, uh, at least not with a, I, we would probably have to do it with the JV. I mean, so, so Yahoo manages to do this pretty right. effectively in China. Um, building a platform for self-expression is, yeah. is challenging. I mean, we're, we're blocked in, in the better part of China most of the time for something that was posted on Tumblr that week. So it's, that's challenging, and I, I haven't cracked that one. Just one add-on question to the China one is one of the things I've seen as a layperson, I'm not involved in, in the Internet uh, you know, like you are, but you see that you know, there's this great innovation comes out of, uh, say, the U.S. typically, and then you see a copycat come up in Germany, the exact same copy of the same thing. And how do you protect yourself against that? Uh, like, what, what's your strategy, and is there sort of any other general learnings that you've had so that when you come up with an innovative play like this, you don't then have to end up acquiring everyone who copied you around the world as you want to make it more of a global platform? Yeah, I, I don't know that I have any brilliant answers to this, and this is definitely one that you, you end up navigating. There, there are, you know, I, I would say that the, perhaps the most important thing to stay focused on amidst Lot, I mean, you should be so lucky to have copycats showing up all over the world, it's to not get too distracted, to not get too freaked out, and remember that most of them aren't going to stick around. Just the, the, the personalities that go and clone something because they see it kind of working in the US um, aren't the type of people that really innovate and, and show up with anything that, that will be meaningful competition. So as long as you stay focused on what you're building, making it accessible to people all over the world, which again, you can't do in all businesses, but with something like Tumblr, we were able to do, we were able to um, add localizations. Tumblr is available in 13 languages today, and that's, when I say available in those languages, we have you know, native language support, very robust translations of the entire site, um, even local curation and editorial of that content. So when you sign up in Germany, you're gonna get great German content. You know, a, a robust localization like that is one strategy for, for fending that off. An international kind of comms or marketing plan is one way of fending that off. But it's not, uh, it's not always easy, and that, that can be a real, I, I, real I, burden to a, a Let a, us, let the tech guys, let's sorry. see the Tim Cook video. Just I think, Tom, to answer your question and to expound on what David is saying, let's look at Tim Cook and what he says uh, about how Apple handles this. business is not based on having information about you. You're not our product. Our product is our these and this watch and Max and so forth. And so we run a very different company. We're just not making products to sell. You know, that, that's a very, uh, that doesn't get me up in the morning. Uh, I, I get up in the morning and many other people get up in the morning to change things. I mean, that's, that's who we are as a company. That hasn't changed. That will all, we may change other things. We may become more open. We may participate in these things that we haven't done before. But what drives us are making great products that enrich people's lives. It's the same thing that's dr driven Apple forever. I was at Compaq at a time where the uh, objective was to become a $40 billion company. Well, employees don't get excited about that. This isn't something you wake up and you go, I'm going to take the hill today to do for it. And you know, it's just not that. But changing the world. These are the things that people work for. And this pushes people. Sometimes in the valley, you can all, everybody can get so fixated on one thing. And lots of companies pop up and, and, and do those things. And, and you're not thinking enough about the next, next, next thing. Um, and so it's, it's something that, that we think about. Okay. Um, the next, next thing. What is the next, next thing for Tumblr? And, you know, and I will say what he was driving in here, I think is very valuable for all of us, is the things you say no to. You know, there's all, the, there's all these great ideas. And I think, to Tom's point, how do you fight off t uh, competitors? As soon as you say a competitor is doing this, sometimes we entrepreneurs run after that. Mm -hmm. We want to chase that, you know, because it's number one, we're competitive. Number two, it's a revenue opportunity. And how do you say no to a lot of things? 
because there's, there's all kinds of ways. I'm sure y'all come up every day at Tumblr and, and with the clarity, you know, as, as he has. I don't know. We never had that problem. That's a sensibility we really look for, I think, is, uh, uh, or have designed for in our team, are people who really want to build stuff that works, that's meaningful. So the idea that we put anything into the product that only like 5% of our users use always seemed really wasteful. Like we could be using that space to make another feature bigger, better, more accessible. So you know that's 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 definitely down there in our DNA and um, has been pretty pretty clear to us. Uh, it does take some discipline. I mean, it takes like even just the wherewithal to go back and look at everything that you've launched previously and really scrutinize whether or not it's working, whether or not you did it as as well as you how could, whether or not that was the person. How, how hands on are you with you? with this product? Right? I've, I've tried to stay very, very hands-on. I, I haven't committed code in about two years, which is heartbreaking. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I still get to spend a whole lot of time with our product team. So I, I have weekly meetings with each of our product teams, which are broken out into categories like the Tumblr dashboard, the people that own the, the dashboard experience, the folks that own the creative tools experience, the mobile teams, and uh, uh, things like our search and discovery team. So a whole host of. Uh, teams focused on big, big parts of the product that are through the week you know, cracking on big, ambitious updates uh, to those corners of Tumblr. And we sit down every week to look at the mock-ups, to look at the development, to look at the roadmap, and uh, just constantly challenge ourselves on, like, is, is the stuff that we shipped last month working? Do we feel like we solved those problems, that we delivered the best product that we could? Do we think that we have you know, have we learned anything? Do we have whole new ideas to improve that stuff? Well, you know, there's this then, thing on entrepreneurs, and yeah. this is people who acquire entrepreneurs, I always hear the same thing. I'm scared to give them a lot of money, because if I give them a lot of money, you, will they still be motivated to come in and work like they did when they were independent? And what I would like to say is, how has it been post-acquisition? Uh, because I, mean, I understand you're independent and all like that. How much is Yahoo involved themselves in your business. You're very involved. Have they, how many, I mean, are they calling you and saying how many users we got today? How many more followers do we have? Are there metrics they're managing, you know, managing this acquisition? Sure, by? sure. Um, I mean, the same types of metrics that they use to manage that whole company um, and the same metrics that we use to manage ourselves. So, you know, we, we have all sorts of dashboards that we produce every week and a whole bunch of those go to uh, uh, Marissa and, and get circulated with her executive team. Um, I sit on that executive team, so I sit down and, and present, you know, as we go around the room every, every Monday, we sit down and, uh, I don't sit down, I'm on the phone since I'm out here, but uh, I, I call in and I run through those Tumblr numbers. Um, you know, beyond that though, to, to answer your question about, you know, how is, are they calling us up and harassing us, or they are, you know, how, how heavy a hand do they have in the, the business today? Um, it's, a, it's a thoughtful one on both sides. They are absolutely present. Um, they're present in a very thoughtful way. There are a lot of ways that we have to work with them just because we're part of a public company now and because they have the specific ways of doing things. We have to work through their finance team. We have to work uh, with their HR team plenty and their, their legal team. Um, we have our own HR, legal, and finance teams. We, we buffer a whole lot of that stuff. So when you're working with, when you're working on a project that involves uh, policy or, or law, uh, well, working on working inside Tumblr. You're working with our own general counsel. You're working with our own own policy team. Um, it's it's actually worked phenomenally well, and you, you have have this great um, backstop in Yahoo. You have this you know huge company behind you with incredible resources. When you know our, our little uh, six person legal department, when our uh, uh, I'm not sure what are the other good examples? Yeah, when, look, when, when we, or uh, when, when our uh, team of 200 engineers is, is uh, uh, able to lean on Yahoo's team of 4,000 engineers to help support our efforts. That's a pretty awesome thing. Well, that, that is phenomenal. As, uh, I congratulate you on your success, but prior to your acquisition, Yahoo, let's face it, I mean, it was publicly in the papers. It was a, could become stodgy and bureaucratic. In fact, one of your tumblers, I saw one of your tumblers now, 
one year announcement since the old man bought Tumblr. Old man Yahoo bought Tumblr. That was that came out. I remember. And, I'm one of your, not for me. No. I, I, I didn't say that. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I saw that one come across my screen, and I thought, I wonder if that one got cleared with Yahoo. Old man Yahoo. You know, there, how are you, there, there's got to be some bureaucracy there. I mean, it's uh, in, in working with them. Or is, Mar is Marissa your scapegoat? You've got Marissa's commitment, and if you need to call Marissa, you can do that. You know, on both sides, I think we, we both made promises to our teams and kind of told everybody how it was going to be. Um, and we, by the way, we said a lot of those words publicly too, just so everybody would know that we weren't full of shit. And um, you know, Marissa said publicly that we promised not to screw it up. She told her team that we're not going to screw this up. I, I told our team that we were incredibly excited about this and that we would continue, uh, that we would move forward as an independent company, that I was staying, that our leadership team was growing and that we were investing in this thing and that Yahoo was going to be supporting us as an independent company. And I think on both sides, we've lived up to those promises. Okay, very good. Final part of the interview is this. Going back to 12, 12 you started coding, right? Tell us the markup story. language, just to be clear, because uh, engineers would, would uh, get upset over this distinction. Markup languages, I, I, was, I learned HTML when I was 12. I don't think I learned to code until I was 14. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, let's look at the Monica video. Let's look at this just one second. I want to know your, your thoughts on this right here as this video shows. This is, you can- Want me to talk over the video or wait till the end? Wait till the end. Okay. This, here we go. This. Our goal at Breaking Business is to get kids fired up about business and entrepreneurship. We believe that business can be so much fun and at Breaking a Business, we want to teach kids exactly how much fun it can be. A lot of students get all the way to college these days and haven't really had a true business lesson throughout their school experience. There's a lot of skills like building a website, creating a marketing pitch, going out and making a sale that are critical to succeed in today's world that kids just don't get that kind of exposure and practice to throughout their K-12 experience. Okay, and also on the stage here we have Jeremy from New York Code and Design Academy. Mm -hmm. And we got Monica, who's doing this for breaking into business. So if you look at it, would that have captured a David Carr? If you, if you would have been 12 years old and, and Monica was uh, out there breaking into business, do you see value in that? And I'm on, you know, or, or, or was you just so creative and you were such an outlier that you wouldn't, you, that wouldn't have, bothered, wouldn't have well, got you? Cause, uh, so I don't know if it would have gotten me. So I, I never, for me, it was never about creating a... Um, you know, that's not entirely true. So yeah, I, I was going to say that for, for me, it's never been about an aspiration to like be a CEO, a founder, to start a business. Uh, again, you know, this thing started as something that I really, really wanted. I loved to code. I loved engineering challenges. I loved to, to make stuff with my hands. Um, that said, you know, I did, I was actually um, part of the, the Tumblr inception story was uh, you know, a lot of my kind of noodling on the blogosphere and creative tools on the web that would eventually become Tumblr, I was actually doing while I was living in Tokyo when I was 18. I was out there for about a year and uh, made a whole bunch of really wonderful friends out there, but it was, it was at a time when I was working for, for I was um, an engineer at a company in the US working remotely. And what age was this? I, I was 18, so this was like 18 to 19. Um, I, I was uh, living in Hamamatsucho, Tokyo, and working remotely for, for, for these guys in New York. Um, cracking on a whole bunch of personal projects and working on the beginnings of what would become Tumblr. And uh, also meeting, a whole, I mean, the whole reason I went out there was because Japan felt like the future. It seemed like a place to meet a whole bunch of brilliant engineers who were like inventing and building and doing all of this stuff. And uh, I met some really talented engineers, but with a very different view of the world. It was actually very uncouth and kind of crazy uh, for uh, somebody in Japan, at least at the time, this was, was uh, you know, 10 years ago, uh, to be doing what I was doing or thinking what I was thinking, thinking that I, I would go it on my own, that I would start my own thing, that I wouldn't have uh, a full-time paying corporate job. And I actually left Japan largely because I had this really strong sense of like American entrepreneurship. I wanted to come back, and I remember, I remember getting back to the city and thinking like, I'm gonna start a business. It was this like fair, it was, it was the first time I'd ever had this like strong sense of American pride. Like, I'm gonna do something that this, this country and certainly the city is sort of uniquely suited for. 
And uh, I think getting kids into that mode, getting them to start thinking not just about you know, their career as followers, but their opportunity as, as doers, as drivers, as inventors, as, as creators, um, is, has the potential to be a wonderfully empowering sort of context switch for uh, a lot of kids and for a lot of future adults. Yeah, because the, the, the primary, what does the, you, I mean, I think you've revealed in the press, you, you, you got bored with school. And you, did you, what's the story there? I, I've heard conflicting stories, when and where and all that good stuff. What is the? It was less that I was bored with school. Uh, I, I, uh, uh, I was just keeping myself very busy outside of school. Um, I, I was very fortunate to get a pretty great internship when I was 15 where? over the summer working at a, a media company that you, you uh, probably haven't heard of called Frederator Studios. They're responsible for most of the cartoons you've seen on Cartoon Network or Nickelodeon. So these are the guys that produce uh, Cow and Chicken and Powerpuff Girls and Dexter's Lab and Johnny Bravo and all, all the great cartoons that I grew up with and m magically, um, stupidly, somehow managed to get a, uh, a, a, an internship programming, uh, coding at this, this uh, little cartoon company that was starting to experiment on the web, and the founder of that company, Fred Seibert, who is, is today and you know, had become one of my closest mentors, uh, was one of the first people to see, like, one of the first guys in media anyway to see, like, oh man, this, this internet thing is really going to be, is going to change things for our business. So he was one of the first guys to, you know, really, really start pushing more and more of the content that he was producing and creating onto the web. His company, uh, Next Networks, was acquired by YouTube, I think, three years ago. We did all, my, my little consulting company did all of the technology, all the original technology for Next New Network. So that was, that's the, the little tie in there. But anyway, so I got to go work for, uh, work for Fred when I was 15. It was an incredible summer internship that I, I didn't want to stop at the end of the summer. So uh, you, could, you kept can, going. All right, Jeremy, can you, people come into the New York Code and Design Academy, do they, do they all want to be David Karps? Not necessarily. I mean, many of them do, and I think many of them would love to try. But, uh, you know, we have students you know, from as young as 11 to as old as 55, and they come for so many different reasons. We have students who work in media companies who want to interact better with their engineering teams. But there is a subset of students who come because they are entrepreneurs, and we are basically teaching them to code so they can help build those, those projects. For example, one of our first students, his name was Jack. He was a small business owner here in the city. He had a flower shop, but he had an idea to take this flower shop and put it online and you know, sell flowers over the internet. So he came, and as his final project, he launched OrchidDiva.com, and two weeks later had another site going. So, you know, our student body is, is incredibly diverse, but, you know, actually there's a couple of our, our students in the audience who are those entrepreneurs who came to the school to learn those skills to launch their companies. John, John what is the future forum for, you know, I, I think David obviously has done extraordinarily well, but there's no doubt that some of these entrepreneurs uh, see the current educational system and they, you know, they drop out and they, and they don't wind up as well as David did. Is there something there where we can take these entrepreneurs and get them on, on the education system? I think there is. I, you know, I, I kind of watched it from a couple different perspectives. One, want to be challenged and personalized. And obviously entrepreneurs don't keep the nine to five schedules. So how can I do it off hours when I'm able to? Um, two, I, one could argue the MBA, which is what most people would look at from a business perspective to validate what you've done. You could deconstruct that down to just the specific competencies you need to master. So look at it from the perspective of maybe an entrepreneur has the creative thinking, the storytelling, but they need to acquire the competencies to be a good negotiator, to understand how to write a business model. Um, so I think where higher ed will start to go is be able to pick and choose mastery of certain concepts versus a large set of credentials that show competencies that are more general. Okay. What do you, tell me the next, next thing for Tumblr. What, what, what are, you, are you hitting a revenue target, getting kind of back to business here? Sure, yeah. What, what are you, tell me your revenue target. I can't tell you my, my revenue target yet. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you can uh, hang out for the next earnings call, though. Uh, you oh. know, the, uh, Big threads for Tumblr. I mean, there there are many, but but certainly I think you know two worth highlighting today. The the, the big threads that that we're we're um, uh, cracking on right now at Tumblr are the business, which we started to kind of prove the the underlying thesis for in the last year and a half or so that we've really been uh, 
out there in the world with, with uh, these ad products. And uh, now that we start- people, How many salespeople do you have? Uh, our, our sales team is about 75 people today. They're not all sellers. I think we have on the order of 40 plus sellers across the country. So, so, so you said 75 salespeople out there? 75, uh, 75 people on our sales team. So it's probably 40 sellers and then 30 or so supporting people. So, so you've made a big commitment here to sales. I mean, this is, uh, that's a huge. We're going for it, man. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's working. Um, and look, most of those uh, joined in, in uh, January and February. So that was after we had about a year of proving this thing out there in the world. We had started to pull a lot of the data together that really showed how effective advertising on Tumblr is. And uh, we needed more people to, to tell the story. We needed more people to bring it out there to the world and help these brands set up and really, really find success with it. So that's, that is a... You know, because right after we met, in fact, a story ran here at the Times that I looked at and I'm like, oh, I hope David doesn't see this. He may, this might kill my whole conference. David may not come, but although I know you wouldn't do that, I was just kidding. But the Times wrote a story that said Yahoo's ad revenue is actually down 7% since the acquisition. Is there, there's always two sides to a story when I read that. Is there another side of that story? They said Tumblr was supposed to be adding to the revenue and why is Yahoo's total ad revenue down 7%? Uh, I mean, as I believe Marissa and Ken highlighted in their last earnings call, Tumblr continues to, to uh, 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 prop up or uh, help uh, Yahoo's numbers. So right now we're, we're rolled up in those numbers, so it's a little bit hard to see. Probably, um, probably but, what was not said in that story was if you hadn't have done the Tumblr, it might have, be, it might have been minus 14%, and I'm not, I'm not putting words in Which I, I think they explained. So I mean, I think all that context was there. I don't think anybody was accusing us of dragging that number down. Okay. All right, I want to open up to the audience. Any questions from the audience uh, for Tumblr? Yes. Speak loudly. came back from Japan. Thank you. Um, did you ever think about doing Tumblr as a sole founder? As a sole founder? Uh, I, I was technology I, background and... and... Uh, I, so I was the sole founder. I, there was a founding team of uh, uh, a few of us. because we. So I had a little consulting company, so we were, we were doing client work. Um, I was incredibly fortunate to have a now, now no longer with Tumblr, and a very prolific engineer working with me named Marco Arment, who I credit you know, a tremendous amount of Tumblr scaling as well as it did to. Um, but I mean, I, I, my, my, my role in this is everything that I've ever wanted it to be. I, I don't think I've, yeah, I've, I've, uh, I'm any less involved okay. than I would have wanted to Question, be. Question, um, no. Jim Kelly. How did you come up with the name Tumblr? Ah, okay, so there, there is, uh, uh, so if rewind to 2005, 2006, noodling on the, what would, the idea for what would become Tumblr. And uh, there was, I, I was building it really just for myself. It was something that I, I wanted that, that didn't exist at the time. Um, and I hadn't started thinking about it as anything that other people would use yet. So end of 2006, Technorati, if anybody remembers Technorati, it, it's, it, what, what, it's still around, but it, at the time was a, uh, uh, a pretty big part of the blogosphere. They were a service that indexed all the blogs on the web and every year published a zeitgeist. And the, the 2006 zeitgeist showed a pretty staggering piece of data, which was the number of blogs registered year over year was doubling with 170 million blogs registered in 2006. The number of actively maintained blogs, though, that they showed based on who actually posted was falling, it had fallen from like 15 million to 12 and a half million. So I saw that data and said, oh man, there are probably other people out there like me. There are people who love the idea of having a blog, having something on the internet, but are frustrated with the tools. They don't want to write long articles. They don't like what Blogger and WordPress and movable type and all of these things have kind of matured into. Um, they might actually dig what I'm working on. They might dig my idea for my own little, little blog. So, at the same time that I'm starting to think about this as something that other people could use, there was this little corner of the blogosphere calling themselves tumble loggers, who were basically the, the avant-garde kind of like you know, web heads and hackers who were doing something with their own tools that they were hacking together to blog differently 
than what blogging had become, which was you know amateur newspaper column, basically. So these guys over here, they were doing link logs and map blogs, so you know, blogs where every post is laid out on a, on a Google map, uh, photo logs, quote books, a, a whole host of things that were still blog-like in the experience that you, you scroll through them, um, that they were reverse chronological sort of archives, but taking the format and medium in a different direction. And I saw these guys with their, their avant-garde spin on blogging and said, this is, this is the, the ethos, this is, this is what I'm trying to do here. Um, I, I really I, I saw that and saw something that maybe could be bigger than just this funny little corner of, uh, of the, the internet uh, with, a, with a handful of hackers who like, knew how to pull the code together. And I said, you know, maybe if I make this easy, maybe if I actually build a platform to do this and let other people sign up for it, Tumble logging, this, this alternate, this, this bizarro world version of blogging might actually be something that appeals to a whole bunch of people. So my vision, not for something that would be like huge, but my vision for something that some other people might get value, for, value out of was uh, this, this thought that Tumblr, if it existed, could be for tumble logging what Blogger was for blogging. And Blogger and WordPress really did take this you know, funny thing that some hackers on the web were doing and made it something that all of a sudden like every college professor was telling you, you have to do because you need to have something on the internet that like you're proud of, that represents you, that blah, 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 right? So that, that was my, that was the thought. It comes from this, this funny, funny word tumblog that was coined in 2005 by this, this little community of hackers. Okay, right down here. Hi David, thanks for your insight. So you talked about content being sort of this engine that brands should be paying attention to to make sure their experience is more integrated and not interrupting mm -hmm. Most of the big ones do have those resources. I mean, that's how they got to be big. They, they work with agencies that have incredible creative resources. The truth is, you know, that's... What about small folks, entrepreneurs, and folks coming up? So the thing to remember is that there are uh, tens of millions of creators on Tumblr who are doing it. And a lot of them are like 15. A lot of them are doing it with their phones. A lot of them are doing it without any access to anything. I mean, if you've got um, a story, and most people who are building a business who are uh, uh, focused on a single mission, who are focused on empowering or serving a community or a customer, they usually have a story. They usually have something to show for it. And uh, you know, those are resources that the aspiring 15-year-old kid who's trying to find their voice doesn't have. And the truth is those aspiring 15-year-old kids and their phones are finding audiences of tens of millions of people. So What we're finding, whether you're 15 or you've got 250 people in your company, if the day you cannot do authentic storytelling, you're in trouble. I mean, just to be, just to be honest with you, you're in trouble. You need to go learn that skill uh, to be an authentic storyteller. Okay, we've got a lot of questions here. Um, Back, right back here with the microphone. Go ahead. Uh, I really just wanted to say thanks. We use Tumblr as, or maybe you don't want us to do it this way, but mm -hmm. we use Tumblr as a free internet for our company. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, look, I, I mean, it, it's, it's certainly going to be more secure than, than hosting it yourself in, in most of the ways that, that you have the opportunity to. Uh, you know, we, uh, I don't know, I, I am, as a, as a security nut myself, I, I always cringe at anybody putting anything remotely sensitive on the internet. <laughs> Tumblr is really designed for public and open expression. It's, it's pretty wonderful that we don't have those same considerations that Facebook or Dropbox has. Um, but we take security incredibly seriously, particularly protecting the identities of our users is a big thing that we deal with very often when you have like ISIS people like threatening to come and like assassinate journalists who are, who are uh, publishing anonymously through Tumblr, like protecting, uh, protecting the, uh, the whole platform, protecting all of those services is hugely, hugely important, something we take really seriously. Um, 
I'd be careful with anything that you put on the internet. <laughs> okay, let's do some rapid fire questions real fast, rapid fire answers so we can get as many as in because we've got to end this, wrap this up right here. God, yeah, man, yeah, it sucks. You just sort of suck it up and eventually you get used to it. It's fun. I mean, I, it's, it, it is a real privilege and I think it's important to, to um, well, maybe not important. I've, I've done better for just sort of stopping breathing and appreciating that this is a, a real privilege and a rare fun thing to do. I mean, it, 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 I am an introvert. I'm not terribly like articulate or together when I get up here in front of you guys. It scares the shit out of me. Uh, at the same time, it's an amazing opportunity. And you know, I, I'm, I'm also blessed in that I get to talk about stuff that is really meaningful to me, right? This is a debate team, like, you know, show up and make a case for something that uh, I only just got up to speed on. It's not like show up at the talking points. This is, this is stuff that I, I am absolutely passionate about, stuff that I, I am thrilled to get to be working on and always excited to talk about, even if the, yeah, the context is, is sometimes a little spooky. Yeah, I, I'm. What backs up what you have told us today is Yahoo is letting you out here on a free lease. And you, I mean, you, let's face it, you're a CEO of a public company, and you know you could say one thing here and bring Yahoo stock down thirty percent. So no, I hope not. But uh, <laughs> uh, so for Yahoo to give you the free lease to come out here and take questions from the audience, I think backs up what you said that you're you're running independently. Most people have been acquired would not be sitting here next to me. Uh, uh, Mike Nyland. Yeah, outside of work, totally outside of work, what do you, what do, you do for fun? Totally outside of work. So I, I've tried to, um, I still love technology, and there's a lot of really, it, there were a couple quiet years there where it was sort of just mo like mobile phones getting a little bit better and better and better. Right now, we are in like an amazing fucking moment for technology between Arduinos, uh, the flight controllers that, that uh, have started to get, get small and cheap that, that you can put in either you know, a consumerly available or like build at home drone. Uh, 3D printing is the most phenomenal thing. I, so I've, I'm on my third 3D printer. I've melted my first two. Uh, <laughs> but they, that is like, that, that will completely change your view of the world the first time that you need a bottle opener or need a replacement part for, uh, in, in my case, it was a, a hinge on my toilet that broke. And I scanned it and printed a replacement. Um, the first time you download a, what did I, I say, a bottle opener or a funnel uh, or dice or whatever, the, whatever you need, silverware, uh, that you don't have and you go online and you find it and you download it and 30 minutes later you have it without leaving your apartment, it will change your view of the world. So I, I think technology right now is in like a phenomenal moment. You can tell that we're at the outset of it, much like the, the, the new paradigm I remember is digital photography. I remember it showing up and being totally kludgy. I remember my first digital camera that held eight photos and they all looked like shit. And it took like <laughs> 10 minutes for some reason to spool them onto the computer. Um, but you took the photo and minutes later, you had it in Photoshop and you could be editing it. And then you could print a bunch of copies of it. I mean, it was humongous. Um, and all of a sudden, five years later, it was perfect. It was better than the incumbent. It was better than uh, film photography. And it was ubiquitous. Like, it was incredible how quickly digital photography, which I was very much tuned into, progressed. Um, we are in a moment for a few genres of technology right now, mostly around the physical things. The fact that an Arduino can let a software idiot like me make functional electronic engineering without any electronic engineering background is incredibly empowering. The fact that a schmuck like me can actually like watch a 10 minute YouTube tutorial, fire up three, th free, excuse me, 3D design software, make something and then have it in my hands 30 minutes later is like a brave new world that we're living in. So I, don't, I am the most excited that I've ever been about technology. And by the way, I think that's all creative technology too, which is the stuff I get most excited about. Um, I think we were in an incredible moment for, for technology headed into you know, a new paradigm where you know, I just, I'm excited to see how quickly it progresses and what, what it looks like five years from now. Okay, two more questions. Um, right here. Yeah. Austin. Hey, thanks for coming. Um, I just wanted to get an explanation of the like, basic value proposition that you had, how it was integrated. I'm not sure if everyone knows. I don't, I don't know what you guys are doing, but like, the pitch about, about how 
look, the big thing is it's the same canvas that uh, tens of millions of creators are using on Tumblr today to reach an audience of hundreds of millions. So, I mean, Tumblr, we have always strived to be the most creative canvas in the world. You can just do more here than you can anywhere else where the rest of the internet is telling you to like make it square, make it 140 characters, make it six seconds. We're asking you to surprise us. We're asking you to do something that we've never seen before that actually gets us like pining to see the next thing. And some really surprising brands have done a phenomenal job with that. You know, AT&T has done a phenomenal job with that. Um, these guys have remarkable creative resources. They have remarkable stories. I mean, the stuff that GE is doing just by giving a, a lens into their manufacturing and R&D process is like unbelievable. Uh, these guys have creative resources. They have incredible stories. For the last decade, you've had the big technology companies telling you to leave your creative guys at home and show up with your data scientists. We've asked these guys to bring the data scientists, but make sure that the creative guys show up and do most of the talking, because those are the people who have, for the last decade, really been told to stay away from the internet, stick to your Super Bowl commercials, stick to TV, stick to print. Um, the internet isn't for you. The internet is about split testing little blue links. Uh, we're fighting to change that. just like every other post on Tumblr. So every advertiser has a blog. They create posts just with the same tools that every other user on Tumblr create, uh, used, to, used to create. All right, last question. And then what we're going to do, we're going to excuse David, and then we're going to wrap it up here with the panel. So just stay seated. But last question. OK, any more questions? Up there. He, he, there you are, excited. back in the yeah. back. Thank you for being here. Sure. Your humility and your passion and your just you're just a friendly guy, and we appreciate your presence. Oh, thank you. What is the one, you for that. What is the one big splurge you've that, done? Cliff, I, Cliff, I got a quick question for him. <laughs> Talk fast. OK. Uh, Tumblr, uh, the, the cottage industry of medicine. Yeah. Be specific, please. Wait, sorry. I, what was the question? Tumblr and healthcare, the cottage industry. You know, medicine is a bunch of little small businesses all over the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not talking about insurance. I'm talking about healthcare, actually in the trenches, healthcare. Tumblr, healthcare. Can you, just your thoughts? Um, man, so let's see. I, I can speak to it from the 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 advertising perspective. Um, where where the prescription guys have, have started to show up and really tell. I mean, look, you have new treatment for MS that is like in the most real, tangible, dramatic way possible, totally changing humans' lives, changing their, their families' lives. Um, that, that's, those are incredible stories. So you know, that's the, the, um, uh, I'm just trying to think of the big campaigns that have been around AIDS and MS. I mean, you know, huge ailments that there is huge new treatment for. And uh, the, the folks in healthcare and the drug companies just, just opening up those stories in a forum where you can really, really tell those stories to a community that's, that's hungry for beautiful, inspiring stories. We, we love uh, Tumblr, but we've stood on the outside looking in trying to figure out how does my small business leap into Tumblr. And, and, and that's kind of what we've struggled with, is how does our small company step okay. into that venue? Okay, what we're gonna do here, thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Williams, and uh, what's one big splurge you've done? Since you, st you still ride around town on your moped, right? Uh huh. And you there's, understand no really big luxury since you sold. If you, is there one big, is it, is it the 3D printer? Was, was that the, the big splurge? Those aren't that expensive. I, everybody in this room should get a 3D printer. They're like, <laughs> they're so freaking cool. No, I, the, the only expensive thing I think I, I got uh, post acquisition was I bought my mom an apartment in New York. She was in a boarding situation at the time and I, I wanted to help her out. All right, not surprising. All right, not surprising. thank you guys. Not surprising. Thank you. Thank you, Cliff. Thank you. Thank you guys. See you. I mean, I, uh, Dr. Schrader, that was a unique experience for us here for the Oxford Center and Bernal University. Can you, can you educate him? Can you, with the next David Carpet coming up at 12, or, is he so far ahead of us yeah. that it's, it's useless to try to even well, educate the, him? Since it was so important to have him here, we won't go through the PowerPoints that I had, because I, uh, but, but the real thing is David 
David Karp is one of the one percent. He's he, he's he's one of the okay stop. Uh, he's he's one of the he's one of the, the folks that in my opinion you can provide information for them to further their careers with, but he di he didn't really need an institutional organized approach to take him to where he was. Now that's 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 David Carr. But what he used, the, the, the markup language and then the, the code, he didn't create. And the markets that he is moving into, he's serving but not creating. So the question isn't, does he need to, to know how to uh, create a code or does he need to know how to run a medical business? No, he needs to know how to address the markets that he serves. And that's more of a current knowledge than a foundational yeah, knowledge. Yeah, I'd like to ask William Sutkin, the president of Presidio Graduate School. It, you know, 20 years ago, when you were in David Corp's position, you would say, let's go get an MBA to kind of take the company to the next level. Is that, is that where, where we stand with that right now? Would David benefit <coughs> getting the MBA right now? And you're, you're president of a graduate school in, in the Valley, in San Francisco. North of the Valley. Okay. David would need a bachelor's degree first. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and, then, and then the graduate degree. But, and I just want to second Dr. Uh, Schrader's comment. Uh, I mean, David is an extraordinary human being. Uh, what he's accomplished, the way he presents himself, his articulate and thoughtful responses to your quick fire questions. I mean, that's the stuff you, you just can't teach it. You're born with it. He's so insightful. And the fact that he's been able now he's seemingly. Got he's got 70 salespeople right now. Yeah, but, but he's balancing a truly creative spirit. His passion comes through with clearly a very competent business skill set. He's able to manage, negotiate, and deal. Um, so he's an extraordinary person. Where I think the MBA is relevant, and this is how you and I first met, because I responded to your blog in the New York Times saying that most MBAs are no longer really relevant, unless it's from a top brand, which you can then leverage, or from a boutique program like ours, which is the world's leading sustainability uh, graduate program. But you know, we, we don't want to get MySpace. See, entrepreneurs are out there as like, I, I, am, I need to know everything that's going on, but I don't have a lot of time. I don't have time to go park. I don't, I don't even have time to get on, online. I can only do what I'm doing. But at the same time, I don't want to get my spaced. And here's a question, um, Dr. Schrader, because I'm going to pick a fight here with my boss, and I might get in trouble. But uh, <laughs> here's a, you're not, the other 99%, you're right on that, but they need to know what Tim Cook knows. You well, know, where the, do you go learn yeah, that? Where but, do you go learn when Tim Cook, what Tim okay, Cook okay. knows? Okay, uh, th there's 99% that have to gain something that David and, 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 and Jobs and Zuckerberg have through some level of education. Um, because most people don't have the credentials to get their foot in the door. And sometimes the education is more a proof of capability in order to get you into mezzanine financers suite than it is to provide you a skill set. I mean, you've got to have some way to prove that you're a person to listen to versus these 500 other folks who are at my door wanting money. The, but the point is, and to me, in today's world, it's not the traditional MBA. It's how can we find out individually what a, a particular person needs to do. I think education has to change its approach to serving entrepreneurs or just business people going forward. Yeah. Like, like, like Google intelligence, I think, I think we need to be able to follow individuals' activities, businesses, and experiences on the internet and tailor subscription education so you don't have to read everything. Yeah, because we got, Monica, you just graduated from Harvard. You've got a company going now. How was that Harvard experience directly to you building a business? 
I mean, it's, it's been a big help for me, certainly, but I really think there's a distinction between someone who's already a successful entrepreneur and what they need versus someone who's yeah, a wannabe entrepreneur. Yeah, this is already successful. This is not startups and all so that. So I think it looks really different. Do I think David Carr should go get his MBA from Harvard? No, frankly, I don't think he needs it. But some of the things that were really helpful for me from that experience, I mean, the big things were people. Uh, not just doors to knock on for help, for funding and different things, but also finding co-founders. Uh, someone to talk to about your idea and help build on that. That was one of the most important things. And then also this kind of just general life experience and perspective that might trigger that idea that you maybe didn't have beforehand. So I think education can be really valuable that way, combined with some practical skills you might need. Um, but for someone like David, I think it's just as needed refresher. I don't know that there's a formal program that would capture him. Tom, Tom you clear. dropped out, let me do one quick, I'll get right to you. Tom, you dropped out of Princeton to start your company and you have built it. Um, did you lose, what, what do you need now? I don't, we won't debate whether you should have dropped, but what do you need now as an entrepreneur building a, a global company in many countries? How are you staying on top? So, and I keep saying this, we don't want to get MySpaced, sure. you know, uh, because you know, MySpace melted. And we as entrepreneurs have to be paranoid a little bit. We gotta be paranoid. There is another David Karp out there in our industry. So how do we stay ahead of that David Karp in our industry? Well, one of the things we do is we really try to focus on always making the assumption when we come into the office in the morning, all of our teams around the world, that we don't have the answer today. What we have is a solution that may work. And I think if you go into the assumption that it's not the right answer and there's always another answer and there's never going to be one silver bullet that solves whatever the problem is, for us it happens to be waste. So we look at all sorts of different ways always to solve that challenge. And I think as long as you're in that state, um, what happens is when, and we've had you know, different copycats emerge all over the place, but what I've noticed, and he was right on when, how he answered it, is that they don't evolve. They copy where you are in 2008. And by 2009, 10, 11, whatever, they're still at that 2008 model. And we've seen that emerge all the time, and then those will end up dying uh, or not thriving. And I think especially in today's incredibly fast-moving world and how transparent information is, um, how easy it is for people to understand, and then also how easy it is to start one of these things, right? Like it's not all as, uh, that difficult as it used to be, especially if there's not a brick-and-mortar component. It's that perpetual innovation uh, that I think really fuels uh, the growth because the business model you, you know, we had when we started is wildly different than the model we have today. Now, the core of it is the same. We're still solving the same problem, but the physical operational method of doing it is evolving all the time. So we just always open up the question by saying, you know, okay, we have, a, we have something today, but uh, let's assume it's not right. What could be the next uh, innovation on top of that? And then also asking from a different perspective, which is, okay, we're trying to solve the problem of waste. We need people to pay for that. How do we get ourselves to do it? How do we get another different stakeholder to do it? Um, and not necessarily the most obvious one that's working today. So those two things together allow us, at least on our end, to be perpetually sure. innovating and stay ahead of the Sure, but curve. externally is where the freight train usually hits us uh, that we don't see coming. For instance, 3D printing. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things we all should do as entrepreneurs is go and learn about 3D printing. We should know that. That's something that could hit us. Mm -hmm. uh, authentic storytelling. So what I am pressing uh, Bill for here, and I'm not getting an answer, is where do we learn that stuff? Where do we keep up the speed on 3D printing? And you know what? It comes to me in packets when I want it to come to me. Well, I, and you do it at boutique programs like Jeremy's or at ours. So our students are essentially Tom. They look at the really big challenges slash opportunities that are facing us today and will in the future. For us, it's not 3D printing, it's climate change, it's the bottom of the pyramid, it's resilience in the face of threatening conditions, uh, natural resource constraints, etc. And taking those threats and converting them into elegant, beautiful business models based on concepts, well, like 3D printing, like, 3D printing, like biomimicry and industrial ecology. Uh, and social entrepreneurship. Um, for us, those are the things that are coming at us externally, and we're a school designed to provide frameworks and indeed applied experiences. So to Monica's point, one of the great things about a, a good graduate program, or for that matter, any good educational program, is access to a network of people actually doing the stuff that your students want to do. What David was doing uh, on his own, more or less, starting at the age of 11 or 12, 
a great program will package into a sort of customized set of experiences. And that's part of what you buy when you buy an education from a program like ours or, or Harvard Business Schools. So it's the combination of access to application and experience with value-added concepts, ideas, theories beautiful, that together make a, a very powerful acad graduate. Beautiful academic explanation. Where's Dr. Gallup's? Dr. Gallup's, come up here. You're going to be in the hot seat here. I'm going to put. Some, well, this is a real entrepreneur who's got 17 offices. He's got a staff back at home right now working. He's got competitors all after you. Everybody in town knows you're the largest ENT. Uh, enterprise in the, what is it the southeast now? Well, yeah, I uh, hope it will be the now, southeast. Now we're, we're, certainly in the I'm not getting the answers. Listen, How do I I'm keep? I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you right here. Okay. Every, entrepreneurs need solutions now, and it's great to go to college, and I did it, and I went to medical school. Forget I'm a doctor because that dumbs me down to about six year old when it comes to business, and I love that education. I think that if we're not all changing every day we're going to be left behind. And education has got to change with us. Hey, this is That's the Get Real Conference. Let's give them a round of applause. This is, these are the, you know, I, I mean, I, in full due respect to these huge leaders up here on the board, I think these conferences get off in this direction where nobody is helping you well, as an entrepreneur growing. And so how could, how could Dr. Schrader help you right now as a, as a you know, you're an MD out there with a, a huge medical enterprise. And there's things you need to know. Well, there are things we need to know, but there are people that we need to associate with, too. So if you could educate our health care providers, our medical assistants, uh, and that is a production line almost. Because let's face it, medicine is going through such a huge transition now that we're going we're gonna to need people to educate those that work under us and provide that, provide that service. So uh, that's one aspect. You know, listen, I don't begrudge the education that I received, and I think it's valuable. We need to know about Shakespeare. We need to be cultured. The question is, are we going to do it the same way that we have been doing it now? Uh, are we going to really evolve very quickly? Because four years in college would have held David Carr back. You know, he would not be where he is today, I don't think, uh, had he gone through traditional education. And there's, it's just different. It's not bad. It's not, you know, I'm not saying that's bad, but you're right. As entrepreneurs, we need to know about what's available. And so sometimes we just don't know what's available. Who's going to tell us, hey, you need to be paying attention to that? That's the kind of program I think that we need. So does that mean, Dr. Schrader, the traditional MBA will be dead in 10 years? I don't think it'll be dead in 10 years, but I think uh, it'll be dramatically different in 10 years. Uh, I, I really think that the idea, not only of a, a boutique program or boutique school, but actually a boutique degree uh, is where we end up. I really think that where education is going using digital communication, and it's not even, it's not even the internet anymore, it's, it's independent cellular devices. Uh, is that we'll be delivering packages of information to entrepreneurs based on what they particularly need to, to know. And then over some time, enough of those packages will be um, assimilated into enough work that a degree is an appropriate recognition of where they are. So the degree is not the point. It's the information that's the point. And, and the degree comes on and validates. And that's where competency-based education comes in, where you give people credit f and allow them to, to demonstrate the, their mastery uh, after they've already learned it. And the, the, the entrepreneur almost said customer instead of student, but the Definitely. entrepreneur is actually helping pick the curriculum instead of the curriculum being designed uh, in, a, in an institution. Right that may be not relevant to the world. Does that work for you? Well, Are you getting warm it, on it, this? It does, but I think um, it's your background, Cliff. I mean, think about it. You know, you developed CRM, right? People, I mean, ha they didn't know they needed that, right? I mean, you went out there and you developed that, and it's all of a sudden some, somebody realized, God, I need to manage my customers. And if the more I manage them, the better it's going to be. So, you know, I don't know that there's always an education out there for Yeah, it, it, just when we went to build, and Arlene Herleman is right here with me, and she was part of the company, and. We, everything was going good till we had to hire a national sales team, and I didn't learn that in MMBA school. You know, in fact, the company gave up on me hiring a national sales team. It was the fourth try that we finally got it, and it was, they, they had already marked it off and said, this company's not going anywhere because... So this, that technical 
of an education that we're needing for entrepreneurs right now. And we're uh, entrepreneurs really pushing the market to say you've got to deliver this for the entrepreneur. Instead of a traditional MBA is still a good, is still a good MBA if you want to go work for a big bank. I, I think they do a fine job. But Cliff, again, I think there's a distinction. I think what you're talking about is an entirely new product that would be wonderful for someone like ourselves. But I think being so harsh on the more traditional generalist education it's a different target market. It's not for someone like yourself who's already grown that business. It's for someone like me five years ago who said, I don't know what I want to do. I need some time. I need to explore different fields. And I think that's OK. It's just a different type of person. And I think what you're talking about is exciting, and it doesn't really yeah. exist. I see Vix and Vodka here. Hello. And I, you've got out into the market. You've got distributorships going, and you're doing well. Who's going to train her to take that? to the next level now, where Vixen becomes a brand, because she's already, she's broken through and got through all the regulations and got all that. So there's a process to that, what she has to do now. And that's where these entrepreneurs are. And if you go out there and you don't get this training, more than likely, you don't get unlucky enough and something's going to happen. Well, you know, and that's a good point, I think. Uh, I mean, how many here are entrepreneurs? I mean. Is it really all of us? And you know, I tell people when they say, Jeff, you ought to go get an MBA. I say, well, I already have an on-the-job MBA. Okay, the problem is I've made mistakes, and making those mistakes got me there. So what we need are people around us that keep us from making those mistakes. Yeah, and also the, the, the traditional MBA, accounting, phenomenal. Do a great job in accounting. Uh, I, I love QuickBooks. You QuickBooks, oh, you're big enough. Couldn't, couldn't have gotten through a sale of the company if I didn't understand revenue recognition. You know, so the, there, 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 there are some aspects of that, but I think Dr. Schrader's right, is that the student's going to be start playing a lot bigger role in choosing. And back to Silicon Valley, let's, what, what is the scoop in Valley on Tumblr? I mean, David is obviously a bright, brilliant guy, but David and I have talked about this. Uh, said, how in the world did you get $1.1 billion for a, a pre-revenue company? So what's the scoop on Tumblr in, in the Valley? Yeah, there's, no, there's really not much of a scoop. I think at the time, everyone was somewhat surprised. It just so happens that the former director of marketing at Sequoia Capital is a very close friend of mine and uh, an advisor to our school and retired just after that sale. <laughs> so he was very happy. Uh, I'm not sure if he was surprised. Uh, Mark Dempster is his name. But you know, I think that's it's part of the, the frenzy, the bubble, and, and valuation ultimately is a relative concept. Um, and we'll see, the, the jury's still out on whether Yahoo itself is gonna really last over the long haul. Uh, Alibaba just has, of course, recently brought up Yahoo into the, into the news well, again. You know, but what it did with Tumblr, Dr. Schrader, the reason I asked this question, like my son, they all wanna go be David Karp now. And they all want to go do what he did. And this is easy. I'll get a $1.1 billion. And, you know, David Karp is as rare as a Tom Brady in the NFL. So the thing is, you got this compression to say, leave school. Why do I even got to go to college? Because look at what David did. And somehow the, the education system has got to fascinate the folks, these type of people, to say, come on over here, because you, we know there's a 99% chance they're not going to be David Carr. Well, and I think, in his own words, you know, he didn't start this endeavor to create Tumblr and a business. He, he had a passion and interest, and he was pursuing development of a, a, an internal drive. Not everybody has that insight. Not, not, and not everybody is lucky enough that when they do have a personal passion, it happens to be attractive to other people. You know, there are lots of things that, that you may want to do that you can't sell. Um, so if you're not, and if you can be honest with yourself, if you're not David Karp, but you are a leader and you want to, to advance a particular uh, business, what are the tools that you need to get there? John, John, is this realistic, what I'm asking for? Can uh, to train these entrepreneurs, or is, is, should we just leave it to the market to do it? Some will make it and some will fail. And, and give me a, uh, an idea of what that looks like. Is these packets Dr. Schrader's talking about? Because this is almost like a, a big business opportunity here. And the entrepreneur sits down on Saturday afternoon at 4 o'clock and says, this week I need to learn about market strategy. They click, and here, here it comes. Here, update on market strategy. Is this just a fantasy? No. 
and again, I, th I think there's two sides to it. One is someone like David Karp, um, obviously in the minority, but clearly he has a lot of business acumen. So you think he has practical application in life around the business, you should be able to get credit for what you've done. So you should be able to credential mastery of concepts, which clearly David has. So that's one side, recognition for what you've done through competency-based or mastery-based learning. The other piece to it is, I agree with Dr. Schrader, I think it has to be personalized, digestible, down to what they need. You don't need to overwhelm someone with either an MBA or a whole degree. You need specific targeted knowledge that's pertinent for you. Almost like if you have an iPad and you use Zite, my wife uses it all the time, you see articles that are based upon, she's a Denver Broncos fan, pops up Peyton Manning and everything he's doing in life. Um, I think you need to take that concept, personalize it to education, to realize that the next David Karp okay. needs. All right, very good. Let me go back to Jeff here. What's the biggest mistake you made since you did not have it, uh, uh, a business education? What was the biggest mistake you made? It's always the same one. It's who I bring in as a consultant and why it matter. It's making the wrong decisions about those. I think that's the biggest one, you know, whether it's the accounting firm, you know, whether it's... Uh, and that requires a background of business to assess a consultant and see if they're going there. So that's a, apparently it does. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> now, but what about, the what about and you were very um, kind to share with the Oxford Center, you actually had a number two that tried to pull a coup. You were out of the oh, country. Yeah. Now, I bring up that subject again. And, you know, we had been talking about that for months. I just don't know how you avoid some of that. I mean, uh, you know, somebody that uh, I let go of our CFO, I let go of our president, and I just had to, you know, jump back in and do what I know to do, and it's been successful, thank goodness. But, you know, I you just know, don't the know. I need some advice from all of the you. The president how avoid who that. tried to take over the company, there were, there were some signs, though. There were some early warning signs there, because you and I had discussed it. I said, you know, I, I'm a little concerned here. Well, you and, mean and maybe 10 years before when you mentioned it? <laughs> <laughs> you did. Yeah. No, but that, you know, how do you get that education? You know, you know how, what educates you to, to look into people's hearts and souls at times to know what they're trying to do? When you're excited as an entrepreneur, you know, you're moving, you know, 90 miles an hour. Well, let me tell you how. Let me tell you how. Because when I went to your office, right, and uh, you and I have worked closely together, he was... You know what? I noticed he was nervous when I was there. I, I noticed he didn't. He was a little jealous that I was there. And I said to you, I said, Jeff, this is, you know, a number two is supposed to be like, I'm going to do everything I can do to help you get there. I think we can teach that in school. I really do think you can teach someone how to hire a number two. Tom, agree or disagree? Because, um, I mean, I think you can definitely teach, you know, the raw skills and, you know, definitely move the conversation forward. I mean, I've gone through the same sort of thing where people have tried to you know, take my job or, you know, especially hiring the wrong people and you learn every time and, you know, what we've tried to do is look at whatever the mistake may be um, and then try to learn from it. What do we change in our approach? Um, what do we change in the objective side, our contracts, our protections, our reporting? What do, you, what do we change in the subjective side? Maybe we take a little longer on interviewing. I think it's a blend of the both. You know, I, I don't think there's one right answer here. I think you can learn it by burning yourself, uh, and that's a great way to learn, uh, because trust me, you know the fire's hot when you touch it and your skin starts burning. But on the other side, too, you can be taught that uh, to some degree, and I think you need to, it's not one or the other. Yeah, you a lot need of to come back, come, you know, bring the two together. Yeah, but would you, a lot of business strategies counterintuitive. You know, because you, know you think of number two, I'm going to hire somebody that's strong, they stand up, and all like that. Whereas I wrote uh, our article for the Times says really a number two should be like a head nurse, mm -hmm. you know, taking care of all the patients, least amount of they don't want, they want the least amount of attention, and it, it runs counter to what we would naturally think. Hey, I want a number two that walks in a room and demands everybody. I, I understand that analogy actually. <laughs> you know, most of all this other talk is way over my head. Uh, but you're right. But, I mean, but you know, so Dr. Schrader, that's where I'm getting to today. These, these entrepreneurs, and that's what you know, the Oxford Center is pushing for, is how do we, we can train people how to hire number two. You and know, and one what of we're things, teaching in the school is about as far away from that as possible. One of the things that, that most people benefit by, from most significantly in an individually tailored uh, MBA approach is six months or a year of internship at a growing burgeoning company where they actually see someone get burned or experience this. Uh, and I'm not talking about someone who, who has been an entrepreneur and run a business for, for 15 years. I'm talking about somebody who's learning 
how to, how to make real decisions. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right, and that's why we have the apprentice program. Because I think anybody teaching, I mean, let me just be blunt here, anybody teaching an MBA program in a classroom today with a professor standing up front, I mean, okay, you know, I guess you can get your ticket punched that way. Yeah. But apprenticeship is a great way entrepreneurs learn. You know, set them with an entrepreneur like a Jim Jacoby here in this audience right here. Jim trained 12, 10 to 12 apprentices that worked in his organization as they, as, and followed him around and, and did things. And that was a tremendous, every one of them got a job. And so, what John's saying, and I, and I agree with, is so as you're in that job, in the trenches, there are ways to evaluate what you have learned and give you credit, whether it's a credential or whether it's an examination, and it, it, it um, goes with you. It's exportable. It, it's something that demonstrates to other people as well as yourself that, you, that you've mastered packets of knowledge. Okay, question. <coughs> Lord, Lord Zander, how did you learn to build, turn a yarn shop into a, approaching an you know, eight to nine million dollar business? You had a thirty thousand dollar yarn shop. Uh, <laughs> you're too kind. But you, Yeah, but you learned when you learned very quickly when we came out to Reno and met with you, and you changed some things dramatically. We said, you know, these are some things coming down the pipe. You learned very quickly in that scenario. Yeah, but I had to. I mean, I learned, but I was making mistakes. I mean, I had to make those mistakes to have learned yeah. what I was doing. Yeah. Um, maybe just one thing to chime in. I mean, I think there's a fundamental difference between you know sort of the objective tools, which are really important to learn. You know, like when I came to when I first started, I had no idea what a PNL was, balance sheet cash flow statement and how you manage those and why they lag and all these things. And those you can really learn. So now it's easier to learn when you, when you have to learn, right? Like if I was being taught and I wasn't needing it, I'd tune out halfway through. When you need it, you're really paying attention. It's an objective tool that you, you know, it's black and white, right? These are the, 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 the functions. And there's the other side of the art of it a little bit, you know, um, understanding, well, when am I going to focus more on cash? Maybe when I'm, you know, cash poor, when I'm going to focus on more on P&L, maybe when I'm cash rich, you know, these various bits and then bringing it together. And then I think the other piece that can really come out in learning is how do you interpret the failure, right? Like for me, you know, reporters always ask, like, what's your biggest mistake? And it's an impossible question to answer because it's like, what, today and then that last minute, you know, in the past week? And the real learning, at least that I think makes companies successful and entrepreneurs successful is, how do you interpret that? Like, how do you take the, the failure, whatever it may be, whether it's a coup, whether it's, you know, just a pay, payment not coming in, right? And what is the way to then strengthen the system? And it's that that I think makes someone really good, because we can, there's so many objective issues and they're different, as you said, for every single business, they're gonna be modestly different, you know, and number two may work in certain personalities, may not even be appropriate in others. And it's that, how do you learn from what you see? Like, how do you get the input back from the universe of what's happening to then make good turns and good decisions? And I think we fail when we just get stuck in the road and, you know, the road's going this way and our steering wheel's straight. And that can, you know, totally be taught, but it's how do you... One last that's question. That. One last question. Talent, though? Like, that's, that's the intangible of talent. Or you can teach technical skills, but to be able to take all of those different skills and, you know, ascertain which is more important than others, it really comes down to talent and... You know, one of my first mentors said to me, you know, we don't teach talent. But if you know someone that does, please let me know because I'd love to go there. And that's still how I feel. Someone like David Carver is a very talented individual. He can take a company from an idea to a billion dollar company. Not every entrepreneur is going to have the opportunity to do that, but that doesn't disqualify them as, a, as the value of their entrepreneurship. Yeah, I guess I'm kind of stoked by, I visit entrepreneurs every week. They got great ideas. They built a successful company and they're a little bit floundering and they need some, they need that bump, you know, they just need a little bit more training and they could take it to the next level. And I, and I see that, you know, over and over and over again. So that's why I, I still think we, we can provide an education format for that individual to go from 10 million to 50 million. That's, you know, it's, it, that's the thing. It's not from zero to one, it's 10 to 50 is where all the jobs are being created. Sure, but sometimes zero to one is the hardest step to make. Uh, it, it, sure, 
You know what? And they have to figure, do that on out. One question. One last question, then we've got to go. I was just going to make a comment. Sure. Um, and the example I was going to say was uh, there's, a, there's a health club that we work out at in Atlanta, and they had, a amazing, they had an amazing cleaning person, and then she left, and then they hired someone else. And the person could clean, but she wasn't clean. The person that they had the first time was a clean person. She just, that's just who she was in her spirit, in her gift, and in her talent, where the person that they hired was good at, you know, wiping off cabinets. But I could tell the difference in the cleaning just by the, the way the person was. So the gift and the talent, your, your, your gift is your talent, and it's in your heart. And it's something that just comes out of you, and then you just find that road, and you just follow it. And that's basically what my sister and I have done. We were basically just saying we're twins here. Um, she's the business side of our business and I'm the creative side of our business and we don't even step on each other's toes as a business working a business together so God gave her the business side for some reason and he gave me the creative and it works all right thank you very much um, I want to thank this very patient panel up here for being with us through this thing I think we were very fortunate to have carp here and uh, all of you uh, I certainly appreciate this open discussion and Dr. Gallops, thank you for coming up here and getting us real. Thank you for the hot seat again. Get, get, get real. And you, here's the thing. All these talented singers you heard are going to be back up on a panel coming up, and we're going to show you that, talking about how they are becoming entrepreneur artists. And you know what? I hate to say this, but they're a lot more fascinating than we are in business. So I really want you to stay and see the creative artists and how they do it. So why don't we take a, let's take a 10-minute break. And we'll be right back. Thank you very much.